Hey guys, welcome back. So today we're going to kick off a new series called Shop Talk. I'm here with David Blythe who owns my local gun shop here in town. It's in Valparaiso, Indiana. And what we want to talk to you guys about for the first episode is about buying a used handgun. I'm sure, Dave, you see a lot of guys come in here uh, looking at their first handgun. They don't necessarily want to buy a new handgun. So they start looking at the used gun section because you can usually find a pretty good deal in the used gun cabinet. But if you're shopping for a used gun, there's some things that you guys should think about, some tests that you can perform on the gun to make sure, reasonably so, that the gun's reliable, it's going to function as it's as expected. Now, the gun shop typically checks to make sure the guns work pretty good when you bring them in? Yeah, when individual guns come in, uh, we will do a once-over on them. Um, now, don't expect your gun shop to shoot them all because it's just too much ammo and too much time depending on how big your dealer is and if they have an indoor range. Right. Um, but we will look over them, make sure that everything's functional. Uh, if it's not, we will mark so uh, on the on the tags so that all the customers know. Cool. And so when you pick up the gun for the first time, all handguns are different. We're just going to cover a couple of basic different handguns here to give you guys some ideas of things to look for. Now, of course, the best possible scenario is your, your gun shop has an indoor range and you can go to the indoor range and actually shoot the gun if they allow you to do that type of stuff. If not, the next best thing is to do the basic inspection that we're going to show you guys here this afternoon. Uh, you know, also it'd be nice, obviously, like a used car, it'd be nice to take it to a mechanic and have it checked out. Well, you're probably not going to get out of the store with the gun to have a gunsmith look at it. So here are some things that you can do. I'm going to start off with the uh, with the Smith & Wesson. Now this is a model uh, 659 or 5906? 5906. 5906. I should know. I have one of these. I just <laughs> did a blog post on one, right? So the 5906 Smith & Wesson, pretty common semi-automatic handgun. Now if I were to come in and look at this handgun, some of the things that I would check first is to make sure that when I cock the firearm, the hammer stays back. When I push on that with my thumb, and I'm going to push pretty hard, I want to make sure that the hammer doesn't fall forward. Now the reason I'm doing that is because somebody may have done a, uh, a garage trigger job on this thing, and if they've taken too much material off that sear, you can push on it, that hammer goes forward and the, and the gun could fire, although this one does have an internal firing pin safety. The next thing I want to do with this handgun is check the hammer drop safety. Seems to function fine. Now this handgun also comes equipped with a magazine safety, so I'm going to pop the magazine out, I'm going to pull the trigger and make sure that the hammer doesn't fall. Now while I'm doing all of these things, don't cover people in the gun shop, right? It's just like any type of other handgun etiquette. Usually if you have a question in the gun shop of, you know, uh, safe direction, uh, always ask um, whoever's working with you and they'll tell you a safe direction to point the gun. Yeah, because that's really important. Because there's nothing worse than coming into a gun shop and seeing some guy waving a muzzle around. So when you're doing this stuff, make sure it's pointed that safe direction. There's no, but nobody over there except a wall. So anyway, now I'm going to make sure that the magazine safety doesn't work. Pull the trigger. That's working. Hammer drop works. Now on automatics, especially 1911s, there's another test you can perform that I do, and that's to push down on the barrel hood. Especially important on a 1911. If you push down and you feel movement, there's something wrong with the linkage. The handgun's not functioning properly. Pull the slide to the rear and make sure that you can lock the slide open. This handgun has a slide stop right here. Make sure that those controls work, that you can easily lock the slide open. Next you'll want to check the bore. Dave, did you bring out a, a bore light or something? Now of course you want to make sure the weapon's clear, but this will require you to look down the muzzle of the firearm. And how's this bad boy work? This is the button on this yep. end, right? There we yep. go. So I'm just going to put a light source in here and I'm going to look down the bore. And what I'm looking for is heavy pitting or rust in the barrel. You also want to look at the crown of the barrel to make sure that there's no damage to the crown. If you have a big nick in the, in the crown of the barrel, and the crown is that edge right where the rifling ends, that can affect accuracy. It can cause it to not shoot nice tight groups. If you do see something in the bore that you're not quite sure what it is, uh, don't hesitate to ask your gun shop to, you know, if they'll run a swab through it um, so they can get a clear picture of what that bore looks like. Um, if they're not willing to do it, then they probably don't want to sell that gun very bad. So. Yeah, I agree, and that's a good point. If you see dirt in a barrel, that's not uncommon. When a gun's been fired quite a bit, you know, especially somebody trades one of these things in, the gun shops aren't going to sit and scrub every barrel or anything like that, right? To, you know, on, a, on an average day, we'll have anywhere from 20 to 50 gun turnaround where we, you know, see in and out. So we can't go around and, and clean every single gun that comes through right. here really thoroughly. Um, I'd have three full-time guys just <laughs> cleaning guns. Just cleaning guns. <laughs> right. So it may just be gunk in the bore, and, and they should let you run a bore snake or something through it to mm -hmm. clean it out if you want to good, get a good uh, picture of it. Check out the sights. Make sure the sights are solidly mounted on the gun, that they're not moving around, they're not loose. 
Is there anything else that you can think of, Dave, on a semi-automatic that you would check for? Um, of course, when you're buying a used gun, you always want to know what comes with it, so ask about the accessories that come with it. Um, if it comes with multiple mags, you probably want to put each mag in it and make sure it locks to the rear, make sure the followers and the springs and the mags are functional. Yeah, good point. Um, semi-automatic, uh, you know, in, as long as you know each individual model and the, are familiar with the model that you're looking at, um, you know, they could have different features. Right. You know, this may have different features than a Glock or... Uh, 1911. Yeah, so. striker fired and stuff like that. Right. Certain. So each in, each individual gun may have a, a few different variations that you need to look for. You may want to check the trigger pull too, just to see what it feels like. Um, that's usually more cosmetic. That one has a nice trigger on it. Um, yeah, but you want to make sure the gun functions. I, I think that's pretty much everything. One so. thing, um, you know, from a dealer <clears throat> standpoint, you never want to disassemble a gun unless you ask them uh, permission previously. Good point. Um, you know, it's it, you know, especially if you aren't fully familiar with the the style of gun, and you don't know how to get it back together correctly. Right. Uh, I see that pretty often. Someone you know comes and looks at a used gun. They think they know it, they're exactly how to disassemble and. Um, you know, take a look at that gun, they'll do it, and then they can't get it back together, and now I'm dealing with pieces everywhere. Yeah. So, um, typically, make you sure know the guy. ask permission, um, and, you know, when you, if you can, take it apart, make sure it comes apart and goes back together cleanly. Yeah, if they know you, uh, like I come in here pretty much every day, if they know you, they'll probably be more inclined to let you take the gun apart, but don't expect them to let you take the gun apart. So the next thing that we could take a look at here is a revolver. Uh, now, you guys know I'm not a real big Revolver guy, you don't see a whole lot of them on the channel. I should change that. You got to help me there. Um, <laughs> but revolvers are another thing altogether. Now, when you're checking a revolver, there's a few things I like to take a look at. First of all, with the cylinder open, this one has a swing out cylinder. If you're looking at a single action Colt or something like that, obviously the cylinder doesn't swing out. But we're just going to talk about this Ruger Security 6 here really quick. Again, with the flashlight, you can check a couple of things. Here on the back side of the barrel, that's called the forcing cone. You want to take a look at the forcing cone and look for any type of heavy erosion. Again, you'll want to take a look at the muzzle and make sure that you don't have any damage to the crown. Then you can take a look at the board. Just put a light source back here. You don't need to shine it down the barrel. Put a light source in the back, look down there, and you can see that the rifling is nice and sharp. The barrel's good on this handgun. The next thing you'll want to do is the same thing I did with the semi-automatic. Cock it, push forward. Don't touch the trigger, just push forward to make sure that that hammer doesn't fall. Then pull the trigger. Make sure it works. Now this is how I check timing, Dave. You can maybe, you know, if you have some other way that you do this, let me know. But I just put, apply a little bit of pressure to the revolver and pull the trigger and make sure that when that hammer falls, the cylinder's locked. The cylinder's locked. Now if the time's out, timing is out, that cylinder may not be locked when that hammer falls and that will cause a problem. So then you just want to go through and make sure that the gun fires. Now some gun shops, I don't know how you guys view this, I should know, uh, may not like a whole bunch of dry firing. What, what, what's the typical policy on that? You know what, for us, it, it, a lot of it depends on the age of the firearm. Um, most modern uh, revolvers uh, work off a transfer bar system. You're not gonna damage the firearm by dry firing it, um, but you always wanna ask. Right. You know, you never wanna go in and just start trying it. Um, but an older single action, let's say, um, or a rimfire revolver, right. uh, we'd be less inclined to let you do that. Right. So be sure you ask, just don't start pulling the trigger on the guns. Next thing I like to look for is to make sure, now you can, on this handgun I can just slightly cock the hammer which will free the cylinder up to rotate. And I'll hold it up to a light source and I can see what's called the cylinder gap. And I'm just looking to make sure that the cylinder gap is even and very tight. Now the best way to check this obviously is a feeler gauge. You can stick a feeler gauge in there but most people don't travel around with a feeler gauge. You just want to make sure that everything locks up. Again, check the sights, check the trigger. Dave, is there anything else that you would recommend when you're taking a look uh, at a revolver? Just one thing when you were checking the timing, you know, after that first lockup, uh, you were going through and checking the double action and how well it locks up once it's done. Um, what I like to do is I like to go fairly slow when I do that uh -huh. um, because it can be off and the inertia of the cylinder going around can kind of give you a false positive. It could be out of time, but it seems that if you're going fast, right. that will tend to, to lock up. So I like to go and I like to hear that second click of when it pops in. Okay. And that's the only good point thing that I have. Absolutely. Make sure that it lines up nice. Another thing I look at is make sure the crane, this is called the crane of the revolver, make sure that's not bent when it locks into the pistol. You can see everything's nice and straight. Um, people can do this and this is one of the biggest no-nos and if I ever see somebody do it, it just freaks me out. And I'm not gonna do it, but you'll see people open up cylinders on revolvers and do the slap with the cylinder. By doing that, you can very seriously damage a revolver, especially frail revolvers uh, like Smith and Wessons and things like that. Uh, you, you just don't want to do that to a handgun. 
it, it can very seriously mess up the timing. Um, and, and you know, it, it's not a, a simple job to get that fixed. Yeah, you can seriously damage the gun. Now the next thing I want to talk about is dealing with antiques. And for an example of that, I have this old German Luger. If you guys are going to look for a handgun like this, you really need to know what it is you're looking for when you go shopping. I, I mean, there's certain things that you can check, some of the stuff that we've you know, shown you here, but you really need to know when you're buying a collectible handgun such as this, which has a very unique market appeal and value, you want to make sure you know what it is that you're looking for. The manufacturing date of the pistol, who manufactured this particular pistol, do all the serial number parts match, what parts are serial numbered, does it have its original magazine, all those things dictate whether or not you're going to get a good deal on the handgun. If you don't know what those things are, you probably ought to do your research before you run out and buy a handgun such as this. Dave, is there anything else you'd like to add to that? Um, you know, you have to, to know that every dealer is not an expert on every style of firearm. You know, if someone would bring me an old Luger like this, I don't necessarily know you know exactly what it is either. You know, I do, we do the research and try to price it accordingly depending on all that stuff. Um, but you know, if you have a question on some authenticity, um, you know, feel free to take a look at it, take pictures of it, take take the numbers off of it, and do your own research. Um, and you know, you can ask your dealer, you know, if, if he knows any specifics about those markings as well. Um, I pulled but, this one out of the case because I want it so bad. I yeah, come I know. In here. You've been looking at that one for <laughs> for over a month now. I know. Yeah, I come and handle it every time I'm in here. But anyway. <laughs> Was there something else I didn't mean to cut you off? Was there something no, else? No, um, not that I can think of. I mean, again, you just got to know, um, you know, know each type, style of firearm and, and maybe what to look for. You know, with the Lugers, the action is, is quite a bit different than a lot of other firearms. So you just have to know if there's any issues that's, that's related to those. Absolutely. Now, when you're shopping for a used gun, you can expect typically to be able to negotiate. Now, I can't speak for every gun shop owner in America, but you know, if you if you buy if you're looking at buying a particular firearm, you can say say that they have a price of $450. You may be able to negotiate that price a little bit on a used gun, certainly more so than on a, a brand new firearm. Um, but don't come in and just lowball the gun shop. Don't come in if they have $400 on it, say I'll give you $150 for it. You're not going to make any friends at the gun shop. And actually, you, if if you intend on shopping there a lot, you might want to. Uh, be a little bit more careful about how you approach things like that, making deals and stuff. It's definitely true that uh, dealers usually have a little bit larger margin on used guns, mm -hmm. um, you know, but, uh, you know, the, the profits right now with the new gun industry, profits are, are getting slimmer and slimmer all the yeah. time. Um, so dealers tend to try to make that up on their used guns. Yeah. Um, and it's no problem making an offer, just make sure it's a reasonable one, um, be willing to work and don't be offended. Yeah, you know, exactly. if, if they don't do the deal, that's you know, let it go or, or reevaluate, you know, the price you're going to pay. Yeah, or just wait a few months. If it's overpriced and it's really overpriced, sure. it may still be in the cabinet. You know, you come back in a couple of months. All right, so guys, if you have any questions about uh, anything you saw here this afternoon on this episode of Shop Talk, you can ask those questions in the comments below. If you guys have any ideas about stuff that you'd like to see us cover in a future episode, put those in the comments below. You can also swing by the Bang Switch, which is the blog. You can ask those questions over there. And you can find us on the Bang Switch at www.thebangswitch.com. And you can find us on Facebook at www.facebook.com forward slash military arms. Thanks for watching, everybody. We'll talk to you guys soon. Hey guys, welcome back to this episode of Shop Talk. Today we're going to talk about subcompact handguns. And I have Dave Blythe, the owner of Dave Sports, or Dave Sports. <laughs>